Kill Devil Hills, North Carolina, December 17th, 1903. Cold and overcast. Sustained northerly winds, 20 miles per hour. Orville Wright lies flat on the muslin and spruce body of their Wright flyer. Twin propellers buzz behind him. He won the coin toss to attempt the first flight today. Orville and his brother Wilbur have flown 700 glider flights on this beach. But this is a powered flight. They've tested the aerodynamics using models, but the real thing is often different. His brother unhitches the rope, restraining the flyer, and it slides forward on its takeoff rail. Seven miles per hour? Eight? Cold wind knifes through Orville. Then, a sense of lift. He's airborne. He's been up eight seconds. Nine seconds. He struggles to keep the flyer level. The front rudder seems to have a mind of its own. It pitches the aircraft up, and when Orville corrects, it dives for the ground. Wham! The flyer hits the earth, breaking a lever and cracking a skid. But they've done it. The first powered flight. 10 feet of altitude, 120 of distance, and 12 seconds in the air. By the end of the day, their flying length of 800 feet per launch. This series is brought to you by Digital Extremes, the makers of the free-to-play co-op shooter Warframe. To experience the wonders of the stars yourself through the eyes of your very own space ninja, be sure to check out the game at the link below. The Wright brothers may not have been the first to achieve powered manned flight. A German immigrant named Gustav Whitehead claimed to have flown his own aircraft two years earlier, sparking a debate that continues to this day. But regardless of who flew first, the era of aviation had arrived. Indeed, Whitehead and the Wrights were only arguing over who made the first manned powered flight, because glider flights had been conducted since 1879, and the astronomer Samuel Langley had flown unmanned powered aircraft back in 1896. Because while history loves to celebrate firsts, in truth the world of aviation had entered the era of incremental achievement. Within a decade, aviation went from being a niche interest to a world-changing technology, and it happened bit by bit. Better propellers, designs that moved the rudder from the front to the rear of the aircraft, and greater understanding of the airfoil, the wing shape that deflects air, creating lift and drag that allows an aircraft to take off and maneuver through the sky. And with these discoveries shared via international science journals, themselves a new invention, engineers around the world could incorporate new discoveries into current designs at a rate never before seen. Five years after the Wright brothers took their flight outside Kitty Hawk, French engineer Louis Blériot crossed the English Channel, and less than a decade after, the Italian and Bulgarian militaries were flying reconnaissance and bombing flights. It was an omen of what was to come, because World War I would reshape the airplane and end its optimistic reputation as a symbol of peace and progress. Early in the war, aircraft were merely reconnaissance craft. What weapons they carried were usually grenades lobbed at enemy trenches, or pistols that crews used to blaze away at each other. Then came the machine guns, the bombs, the interrupter gears that allowed pilots to fire through their own propeller, increasing accuracy. In 1914, the Japanese Navy bombed German possessions in China, with a raid launched from a seaplane carrier. In the rush of combat, aircraft went from the clumsy, kite-like design of the Wright brothers to the lethal dogfighting machines we know today. Germany was at the forefront of that development. It was the first to develop the interrupter gear, the Zeppelin, and the Junkers J-1, the first all-metal aircraft. In fact, Germany's air forces were so feared that the Treaty of Versailles, the document that ended the war, forbid Germany from having an air force of any kind. And as a result, German officers began looking elsewhere for air power. Konstantin Salkovsky was a recluse. Other villagers in his small Russian town tended to avoid him due to his strange ideas. As early as 1903, Salkovsky began writing about humans using multi-stage rockets to travel the cosmos, living on strange orbiting space stations with airlocks and closed-cycle air systems. But unlike Jules Verne, who simply dreamed of space exploration, Salkovsky did the math, presenting it in papers and testing designs in wind tunnels. These unorthodox ideas were initially dismissed, but in the 1920s, they gained credence as rocket science developed as a field. In France, an engineer independently discovered some of Salkovsky's equations, and an American engineer, Robert Goddard, launched the first liquid-fuel rocket. 
Despite these advances, many in the academic world still considered spaceflight an optimistic daydream, with one German pioneer even having his dissertation on human spaceflight rejected as too utopian. But others didn't see rockets as such a waste of time. In 1932, a group of German army officers came to a private rocket launch. See, the Treaty of Versailles may have forbid Germany from having an air force, but it said nothing about rockets. If developed properly, they thought, rockets could be capable of long-ranged bombardment. The rocket launch failed, but the officers were impressed, especially by the youngest member of this group of amateur researchers, a 20-year-old graduate student named Werner von Braun. By the next year, von Braun's life had changed. He was using military funding to conduct research for his doctoral thesis on liquid-fueled rockets, and he started prepping to launch his first rocket, the four-foot-tall A-1. But that wasn't all that was changing. In January of 1933, the conservatives, who hadn't won enough votes to form a governing coalition, formed an alliance with the Nazi party, making Adolf Hitler chancellor. Within months, the Nazis had seized control of the government, stripped civil rights, arrested political opponents, and began building concentration camps. Von Braun was under no illusion of who he now worked for, but the government had the funding for his beloved rockets. So he kept his head down, building, refining identifying problems with rockets that blew up on the launch pad or fell from the sky. And soon, his launches became more stable, and the Nazi party began to show major interest. Von Braun started feeling the political pressure. In 1937, he was given the choice to either join the Nazi party or give up his directorship. He joined. In 1940, the ruthless SS made him the same offer. And again, he joined. Soon the rockets he loved would fire 55 miles in the air, reaching space before raining down on the civilians of Britain, Belgium, and Sweden. The double crack of an object breaking the sound barrier went from an unknown noise to the stuff of reoccurring nightmares. Hitler had his vengeance weapon, as the propagandists called it, his V2. Von Braun received orders to concentrate fully on perfecting and producing the V2. They were mass-produced, using slave labor at a nearby concentration camp. 12,000 would die building the missiles, a full 3,000 more than the missiles killed in Allied cities. But by 1945, von Braun was plotting his escape. Germany had lost. He could hear Soviet artillery, and he did not want to fall into the hands of the Soviets. Using forged documents to justify their movements, and pretending to be part of an ultra-secret SS program, Von Braun's team stashed boxes of data in abandoned mines and detonated the entrances. Then, they drove at night to avoid Allied air power and made it to American lines. Days before Germany was scheduled to be divided into occupation zones, an American recovery team surrounded a rocket factory in what would soon be the Soviet sector. They grabbed everything they could carry and hightailed it back to the American zone. This data would serve as the foundation of the American rocketry program. But once in the U.S., von Braun soon found himself disappointed and frustrated. These Americans were no more interested in space than the Nazis were, and they only wanted ballistic missiles to counter the Soviets. Any research, satellite development, or sending doomed monkeys up in capsules was geared toward military application. And the funding was scarce. And yet, there were interesting things going on in the deserts of the Southwest. The U.S. military contracted all of its production to private industry, making for a better quality product. Their development programs were a true mix of civilian administrators and military officers. And in California, they were using rocket-powered planes to break the sound barrier, creating a core of military test pilots practiced in a new, highly technical type of flying. One where the object was to push an experimental craft to its limit while remaining calm, in control, and able to gather performance data. This trifecta of military, civilian experts, and private industry were scattered between different programs and departments. But not for long, because on October 4th, 1957, a new star would appear in the heavens. A star called Sputnik. And in the panic, Von Braun's rockets, the civilian administrators, and the daredevil scientific pilots would reorganize under a new organization, NASA. It seems as though the most beneficial breakthroughs humans made in their quest for the stars are byproducts of them trying to destroy one another. It really makes you think about the morality of progress and the true cost of innovation. Matt, what are you doing? What does it look like, Lotus? I'm innovating. I got into the Orbiter's mod stash, and there are a ton of cool things I can do to the old lectern here. Check it out.
Redirection Mod. Bam! 44% more shield capacity. Why would your lectern need shields? Airhorn Mod! Ah, I see. Now even I have the urge to vaporize you. Oh, but that's not all. Tanning Bed Mod, Scratching Post Mod, Bro Yo Dispenser Mod! Stop wasting valuable resources. We could be using them to stop our enemies in coming warships. But I've got that covered too. Gaming PC Mod. Now I'm all set to tackle Warframe's newest expansion, Imperium. I can cruise around the stars in my railjack with up to four Tenno Friendos along for the ride. And we can even divvy up tasks like blasting batty ships out of the stars, foiling boarding parties, and keeping our railjack in one piece all at the same time. That last mod seems like the only one worth its required resources. Oh, really? Here you go. Raspberry, my favorite. All right, that mod can stay too.